Okay, hello everybody. Sorry we're a couple minutes late in starting and I appreciate that you're all here. Sorry, I'm clicking a little too fast for the thing to catch up. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, this is uh, yet another of our webinars from the Institute and uh, we appreciate you joining us. Venki Shankar is Professor and Coleman Chair of Marketing in Texas A&M University. And he has been doing research in hybrid bundles. I'm really excited to hear uh, what he has to show us. This is a really nice example of how we've um, found some funded research. And this research should help us make better decisions. So we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Let me tell you a little bit about the Institute and, and uh, how you're all are here. Oh, there's a picture of Venki and a picture of me. I'm Lynn Yanyo. I'm a director at the Institute. And I've been running the webinar series. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you'll find that you're using a tool that we've been using here and in order for you to ask, ask questions during the, the webinar, you can see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A folder that has a Q on it. And if you'll click on that, it'll give you a screen where you can type in your questions. So all of the folks that are listening in, you're all on mute, but you can ask your questions through this format. I'll be monitoring those questions during the presentation. And if it's appropriate, I'll actually feed them to Venki while he's talking and then he can answer them during the seminar or he'll answer them at the end. And again, no problem, just send them in as you think of them, no need to hold that to the end. So I can advance that again. Okay, and I got a little lag time, sorry everyone. Okay, thanks. And so it's like thank you here. So thank you, I'm still, uh, Introducing, and I've got a little lag time on my screens. So as you uh, participate in this webinar, you'll, um, you can feel free to just be 100% with us. You'll get a recording of this uh, if you signed up for the webinar after the event. These are all recorded, and any other handouts that we might be able to provide to you. And of course, if you're interested in more information, feel free to contact any of us, and we'll be happy to help you out with that or put you in touch with Venki. All right, let me see if I can advance again. Having a difficult time advancing. Uh, Lori, can you help me get to the next slide? There we go. Thank you. So, uh, who, who are we? We are um, ISBM, the Institute for the Study of Business Markets, or we call ourselves the Institute. We're a nonprofit a global network of researchers and practitioners. We're headquartered at Penn State and we have been for 30 years, but we have offices around the US, including Philadelphia and Chicago. And the reason we exist, again, Lori, if you could advance me, um, the reason that we exist is that, of course, you all know, uh, if you're in B2B, that there's very little research that is focused specifically on B2B. And so since there's only a small fraction of that de dedicated to what we do, um, what ISBM does is take your membership dollars and um, put those to work at, at universities and with faculty that will do research specifically for us. And then we come back and share that with you. And this is one of the ways we do that. We have a, a large collection of academics that work on research with us. This is just a sampling of the kinds of folks and locations they are. And we also have a great number of practitioners, um, over 50 member companies. And here's just, again, a sampling of those companies. Just to let you know what's coming up, um, you you'll want to schedule yourself to come to Penn State, to State College PA, uh, in September for our big talk. And we're gonna be talking about the modern marketer. There's been a lot of changes in marketing over the last several years, and I think it's ripe time for us to talk about what do we need to be successful. We also have courses that we hold, and the next course coming up is Agile Stage Gate, which is um, going to be in Pittsburgh in June. And then, of course, our, this is our webinar, and then we have a series of webinars coming. If you receive this by email, you're on our, our mailing list. If you'd like to put a colleague on our list, please feel free to send us their email, and we'll add them to that. Okay, so now let me please introduce Venki Shankar, who's going to take over from here. Venki, again, is prof uh, Professor of Marketing and Mays Business School at Texas A&M, and I think you'll find this research that he's done fascinating. So Venki, can I introduce you, please? And you can take over the, the uh, slides from here. Okay, thank you. All right, can everybody hear me? Or 
Yep, you're good. Go go ahead, Benki. I'm still trying to uh, get my screen up here. One moment. Give me a minute. Um, I'm trying to look at the right icon to click back. I have to get back to this. So you can just ask uh, Lori to advance the screens if that helps you. No, but I, I'm, I'm trying to get back into the app. I was in a another app and uh, where should I be clicking to get back into the app? So your app has a little video camera in a blue circle. Video camera in a blue circle. Okay, yes. I think that says Zoom. There you go. Is it? Should I sign in now? I'm not able to get in. I think something is okay. No, don't leave the meeting. Okay, I'm able to get back. Thank you. Okay, and technology is great, isn't it? Um, thank okay, you. So, thank you. I'm going to hand it over to you. And again, if you need help advancing the slides, just ask, speak out loud to Lori, and she'll advance it. All right, sure. First of all, very good afternoon to all of you. I don't know where you all dialing in from, but I guess most of you are from the East Coast, so it's very good afternoon. And those of you from the West Coast and maybe the Mountain Zone, probably still morning. But uh, as uh, Lynn mentioned, that this is an outcome of uh, years of research of me and some of my co-authors, including my former doctoral students and hybrid bundles. And uh, since this is going to be a webinar, it's I will want to be as interactive as possible, but it's not going to be that easy. So I'm, but I'm nevertheless going to invite all of you to be as interactive as possible. So by typing in your queries and uh, letting me answer them as much as possible. So feel free to do that as we move along. Uh, first of all, before I go further, uh, is it possible, Lynn or Lori, to get a sense of, uh, I ask a quick poll, can I get a quick response? Um, and so we don't actually have a way for polling. We can okay. only ask people to send in questions. Okay. All right. So, so that's what you mean. Yeah. So I'm going to start uh, with the uh, assumption that all of you are here because you are in your organizations have had uh, a need for coming up with hybrid bundles or you already have some hybrid bundles. So let me just start. Uh, Lori, could you advance the slide to the next one, please? Um, Okay, great. So uh, here's a quote that I want to start off with, and uh, uh, let me just read it in case it's not clear to many of you. By offering a bundle package of products and services, we have improved our long distance and high speed internet services penetration, resulting in increased revenue and lower customer churn, which have helped to offset revenue decreases driven by continuing declines in access lines and product substitution. This is a quote from a company called Embark was spun off of Sprint way back in 2006. The idea was that uh, this emphasizes the fact that more and more companies are thinking about bundled packages of products and services. So that is a uh, combination of at least one good and one service. Lori, can you advance to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, many companies are selling what we call bundles that is combination, as I said, of goods or products, physical products and services. An example would be, uh, can you just, uh, Xerox, uh, which sells copiers, printers, and supplies, and also maintenance, configuration, user support, and other related services. So there's a good, there's a service, and they're typically offered together as a service contract, okay? Um, Lori, I think, uh, all right, okay, good. So I'm an academic, so I'm gonna have a academic definition, but I'm gonna just make sure that we are all on the same page, okay? So what is a hybrid bundle? So one way to think about it is that uh, is a way of exploiting or leveraging an idea that combines at least one good and one service uh, and in the process creating customer benefits that then if you had the goods and services available to the customer separately. So what does it mean? A hybrid bundle has to meet three conditions. One is 
the value of purchasing and consuming the both the good and the service increases as the customer purchases more or consumes more of the good of the service firm. So if you think about your client firm, um, and if you're selling a bunch of products, I notice there are people here from uh, Parker, Hannafin, um, Corning, uh, some of you are from Philips, I notice some of you are from Dow. Uh, many of you may have physical goods and may have lots of services, but if you think about your end, the, the end value to the client, that has to improve when you combine at least one of the goods and, and one service, right? And the providing firms should be selling both the good and the, firm, and the service. So it's not like a firm is partnering with somebody else to offer that. Uh, that we would generally call it as some kind of a marketing relationship, but more so in a hybrid model, we expect the same firm to sell both the good and the service, right? And also the good and the services are combined in a unique way that is new to the firm. So in other words, a firm introduces a hybrid bundle when it has not done so in the past by combining this and offering at a single offering. So I give you an example here in addition to the Xerox example, um, Otis Elevators uh, uh, launched an offering, hybrid offering called Gen2. And what it is, it, it is a combination of the elevator, which is the physical good or physical product, and uh, a maintenance support and uh, monitoring service. So I think I'll talk about this example later, but just to give you a sense that the same firm comes up with this unique offering that they hadn't sold this as a combined offering before. So if you think about why are we talking about goods and services together. How is it different from a situation where uh, we know a lot of bundles where there are two goods bundled together, right? So for example, you could sell, um, uh, if you are Intel and you're selling um, chips, uh, again, I'm using some examples of companies that I worked with. Uh, and as uh, Lynn mentioned earlier on, this research is based on a study of about close to 100 companies and uh, in, uh, looking at their B2B offerings. And uh, Intel is one of the companies that I have worked with. And Intel sell, uh, sells, of course, um, uh, chips and um, related products to OE, as OEM suppliers to many um, uh, of their business customers. So if you think about Intel selling maybe a high-end server chip and also offering um, maybe a, um, a, a mobile chip uh, together to a client, that's a combination of a good and a good. And we know that, that those things many of you may be doing and many companies do it on a regular basis. But how is it different when I actually combine a good and a service together, right? So for that, we need to understand how goods are different from services, right? So here's a view of what I call the good and service continuum. Uh, and um, if you look at this chart, uh, this is a chart that shows uh, the tangibility uh, of different products and services, right? So if you look at the, right at the top, um, it's say your uh, NutraSuite Monsanto, and you are selling NutraSuite, which is a sweetener to a lot of original equipment manufacturing, including Coke, Pepsi, and so on. And you would be selling sweetener. It's a very tangible product. And uh, so when uh, people buy it, they know what the benefits they are getting and the pricing is done accordingly, depending on um, what form, package, what quantity they are sold, okay? So it's very tangible on the left side. But as you start going from the top to the bottom, uh, you start to see that intangible elements start appearing more and more. So from sweetener, if I go to industrial fabric, for example, that's also a, a lot of tangible elements uh, d uh, dominating. Um, but as you go down like plant facility, there's a little bit of service. Um, uh, that's fabrication and other equipment. And if you're selling tractors, let's say you're John Deere, a Caterpillar, if you're selling tractors, you're going to sell also uh, maintenance service, monitoring service, uh, and user support and so on, right? Uh, 
elevator system, again, the Otis example I gave you, you, know, you sell really elevator and escalator systems, which are basically hard um, wear, so to speak. And then you sell a bunch of services together. Then to contract ID, which I think it's smack in the middle, where there's a lot of tangible elements because you have equipment, hardware, and so on, IT, and then a whole bunch of services, which could be um, IT uh, solution services, IT maintenance services, IT uh, uh, response services. There's quite a bunch of services. And then as you start going down from there, corporate air travel, for example, when the airlines are selling uh, air services to corporate clients, uh, then you see a lot of intangible elements because the, uh, um, the uh, it becomes more of differentiating on those intangible elements. Then the oil well service, so if you're Schlumberger or Halliburton, then you would be selling a lot on your uh, services in addition to the equipment. So if you're selling drill bits, completion tools, plus whatever is the related uh, services that go with that. And then if you go to medical research service, then you're selling um, you know, medical uh, uh, searching features, records, and latest advances. So you have equipment and followed by a lot of service that goes with that. And sits, same with system integration, um, lots of service, very, very little physical products together. And then all the way to outsource uh, BP, which is uh, business processing, and um, which is completely turnkey services handed over to that. So what is the imp impact or implication of the difference in tangibility? Well, in a good, typically, uh, there is very low variance in quality. So if you're manufacturing machine tools, for example, you can manufacture to Six Sigma uh, certifications or requirements and uh, you will be very, very confident that the quality will be the same regardless of where the machine tools were made in whichever factory it is all over the world. However, the difference with, between um, a service and a good a service, there's a lot of variability in serv service. For example, in oil well services, you could be doing an oil um, completion um, service uh, in a reservoir, and if you're doing it in Gulf of Mexico, uh, that same service will be different if you do it in North Sea because the people are different, the climate is different, the context is different, and uh, the equipment may itself be somewhat different. So bottom line is you have to manage variability if you're selling more services. So if I combine the good and the service, I have to, on the one hand, I have to worry about service, uh, managing the variance in services and, and also exploiting the low amount of variance in good. So the next slide, uh, talks about economics. So how do we as marketers, uh, okay, uh, Lori, go back to the previous slide, sorry. Uh, so if I, if you were just selling simple goods, for example, I know somebody's from Corning here. So you sell glass, and ceramics, and you, that's goods. And if you sell that as goods, uh, and if you sell multiple goods as a bundle, what you would do is you would simply try to look at the economics in the following way. So in this picture, I'm going to show you on the x-axis number of units, and the y-axis unit price or unit total cost. So you've got two curves in there. If you look closely, there are two uh, different colors. Uh, the uh, green color is the price curve, and the red color is the total unit cost curve. So as you go along the x-axis, the number of units, um, there are three zones here, which I call the dead zone, where the firm makes less money that's when the total unit cost exceeds the price. So initially, uh, you have a lot of uh, unit, total unit cost because of fixed cost and starts declining the unit cost, as you can see, uh, at a faster rate than the price. But then by the time you start making money, that's what is the middle zone, uh, so what I call the sweet spot zone. And that tends to be, starts getting bigger and bigger as the number of units increases. And then finally, what I call a nirvana zone is pure uh, surplus that you're making and lots of money. And that's when your, your brand or product becomes a cash cow and you start milking it. Okay, so that's for goods. Now, how does it look for services? Okay, services, the x-axis is now number of units with number of people because services are people intensive. So as you start adding people, uh, unlike the goods, 
there is a slightly difference in the shape of the curve. So what is the difference? Uh, if you look at the price curve from the previous to this, the price curve is a little bit flatter because you are going to charge based on the number of people working on it, the number of hours, and so on. So it's not uh, going to be uh, easily different based, uh, as in the case of goods. Uh, the unit cost also doesn't decline as steeply as goods because in goods, uh, you can have economies of scale. Here, here, it's very hard to get economies of scale because you can every unit uh, of uh, FTE, full-time equivalent that you add, will cost you money and you have to keep constantly looking for people and sometimes you may not be able to get people, right? So the shape of the curve is uh, a little bit flatter than uh, the price and unit cost curves than in the goods. So consequently, what you will see is the dead zone is actually shorter than the dead zone in the goods case. So in, a, in other words, you start breaking even earlier, but you your sweet spot is longer. So for a lot of people, you keep adding, let's say, ID, IT outsourcing or you know um, telecom services uh, with the business to business, then you actually have, a, uh, as you keep adding people, you'll make money. But then the amount of margin may not be as high as for good. And that uh, looks at the thin uh, strip that you see in the likely sweet spot zone. Similarly, Nirvana zone, once you start really becoming dominant, cash cow, and you start making surplus money. Now, you've seen the difference between good and services in terms of the shape of the price and unit cost curve. But what when you add both of them together? That's the next slide that's coming up. When I actually combine this, Lori, could you move to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, this is the hybrid bundle. When I combine the good and service, what happens is that I add the two services in the y-axis. So that's what will you'll get the kind of shape. So the shape will be the price will be declining at a rate that's in between the rate of decrease between the good and the services, um, and uh, the total unit cost will also be in between that. So what will happen to the uh, break-even point will also be in between the break-even point of the service and the good. And what you'll see in terms of likely sweet spot zone will be a combination of the flatter sweet spot zone that you saw for services and the rapidly expanding sweet spot zone that you saw for goods. So in other words, uh, this is basically a mix between the good and the service. So you're hedging the pluses and minuses of a good and a service by putting them in a bundle. Uh, and uh, so that actually leads to a little bit of risk reduction. So you actually can benefit when the service is more economic, uh, the economics of service is good, and also benefit when the economics of service goods is also good. So this is to give you an idea of what is the underlying economics in a hybrid bundle and how hybrid bundle helps firms to lower the risk and also increase their profit pie and also helps them sustain this over a longer period of time. So now let me take you to the way, how do we then, having known that hybrid bundle actually helps you this way, how do we categorize hybrid bundles that you see for a lot of B2B firms? So two dimensions based on our research came out. One is the degree of complementarity. What is a complementarity? Uh, so that's basically the degree to which uh, a good or the physical product and the service combine to increase the customer value, right? So in other words, some good and services may be inherently, uh, you know, if I combine them, it adds a tremendous value. Uh, and so let, some of them may not be intrinsically very high when I combine them them together, that's what we call complementarity. And that's one dimension. What's the second dimension? The second dimension is degree of independence. So what do we mean by independence? Uh, if the degree to which your customer can obtain the good or services uh, independently. Um, so for example, in the elevator example I gave you, uh, there are lots of service contract providers, maintenance. So some uh, company can buy the, elevators from uh, um, from Otis and then get it ma it's the maintenance contract from independent providers. So they are available separately, but some there are certain hybrid bundles for which they are not easily available. Not just available, they can also be used 
and consumed independent of each other. So sometimes some bundles are inherently uh, tightly coupled so that you cannot use one without the other. Uh, so let me give you the example as we go on. So based on the two combinations, we get four types of hybrid bundles. So this, this picture, the two by two chart, actually gives you the combinations, right? So on the x-axis, you have the complementarity, which is uh, basically low or high, uh, and independence, which is uh, highly independent uh, or highly dependent. So that means the good and service are highly dependent on each other to be able to bought together and use together, right? So there are four types of bundles. So I'm gonna go one at a time, give you examples, and then tell you what is the underlying rationale behind that and how it makes money for the firm, right? So let me start um, first introducing the four types of bundles. Um, as you saw, this is the same picture, but with examples in it. So let me just walk you through these four uh, types of bundles. So right, let's take the first case type of bundle where we see a lot of um, situations where the two, the good and the service are highly complementary. That means it adds value to the user or the client very quickly, but they are also highly independent. They are available and can be bought separately, can be used independent of each other. Uh, let's take the example of uh, in the uh, high tech space, uh, database software and um, services, right? Uh, so Oracle is the number one leader in uh, database software, right? Um, and for them, that software is like a good or a product because you know, they sell multiple units of it and so on. Um, however, there is also uh, a huge market once clients buy the, so the database software because they have to have applications written on it, they have to have maintenance, they have to have uh, a routine um, transactions on it and so on. So although Oracle is a leader in the uh, the good space, but it's not as strong in the services space. And so it was trying to compete for the services part of it by itself, but it was not very effective. So they introduced what uh, I call as a on-demand solution, which is really for a lot of small and medium uh, enterprises. They could actually get the uh, database and then get their systems to run on that. So if, if you, there was a company in the chemical space, then they could actually get the Oracle on demand uh, tailored to their need. And similarly, uh, if you are in the uh, transportation space and you're a client and you have Oracle on demand, you have certain applications um, as a service that comes with the on-demand solution. So this is what I call flexible combo because in here, what we are trying to do is that you're trying to add value because when you when I have the database software and the service that goes with that, as a client, I have a lot of complementary value, but at the same time, I could have got that service separately. I could have uh, bid out uh, tenders or contract just for the service part, and I could have gotten that. But then by Oracle making that a little bit uh, more flexible for the client, they were able to uh, sell this bundle as together. Another example is IBM uh, storage area network solution. Without going into detail, it, it is very similar to the Oracle. Pre pre previously, IBM was selling their hardware separately and, uh, and services and was finding it very hard to compete. But when they combined that, they were very successful. That's flexible. Now, let me take another example on the top right corner or that box where it called the peace of mind bundle, right? Here, the complementarity is low. So it's inherently the value doesn't get immediately added if I just buy the good and the service together. But at the same time, I can also buy them separately. For example, uh, Xerox uh, office equipment and service. So people typically buy office equipment, whether it's printer, copier, fax machine, or all-in-one. Separately, they have a lot of companies to choose from. Xerox, Rico, Murphy, and so many other players, Epson, Canon. Um, but then also, they can also get the equipment service uh, um, contract from multiple players, including some independent services companies. But here, the, uh, the value that uh, Xerox would provide by bundling them is to assure a peace of mind because we have 
Xerox engineers who knows um, this equipment, when you buy that, they know how to fix those things immediately, minimizing the downtime. The greatest example is, a, I would say, is Otis Gen 2 elevator in service, right? Uh, Otis, when they started experiencing a lot of decline uh, in service volumes because clients were going to low-cost service providers, and uh, they introduced a system of elevators which could actually have sensors in it which remotely monitors the uh, working of the elevator. So um, some of the sensors can actually diagnose uh, a problem 24 hours before it becomes a problem. Because if you look at the clients who buy elevators, big building contractors, let's say the Trump Tower or the Sears Tower or the Empire State Building, they cannot afford to have elevators being uh, down. The downtime tolerance is very, very low. So uh, if you buy elevators from Otis, this Gen 2 systems diagnoses in advance, and they have maintenance teams, service teams uh, located uh, in a way that they are one hour within one hour of reach of many buildings. And so they remotely diagnose, and they come in and fix the problem before it becomes a problem. And so that was the bundled solution. They said, if you buy our elevator and our service together, this is an advantage, right? So I think that helped them to give the peace of mind to the client, and that's what I call a peace of mind um, bundle. Now, let me just talk a little bit about the one on the left bottom, where the complementarity is high, that is inherent values added, and the goods and services are used together, but then they are not available that independently. Okay, one good example here is a Cisco sells integrated service routers. So Cisco um, typically sells routers and they have a whole bunch of services that goes with the routers uh, for the B2B clients. And here the idea is that um, obviously if somebody has a Cisco router and the service that goes with it, whether they are using telepresence, which is the uh, video conferencing system across uh, their different offices, or any other routine wireless networks, they would be benefited for sure by using both the uh, service as well as the equipment. But um, also, you know, very hard to find compatible equipment, so they're not necessarily available in independently. So what companies like Cis Cisco do, they add lots of services to that because they add multiple benefits as they add one service after the other. So that's how they bundle together, and then with that, they give a, uh, a good contract price, and that allows them to retain the customers, increase their market share, and so on. So that's uh, one example where um, their benefits are additive. And the last uh, box that I want to talk about is one-stop bundle, which is the top, um, sorry, bottom right corner, where they are inherently not very complementary to good and service, and plus. Um, they're not available that independently. So in other words, this is like um, a situation where a, your client may be looking for a certain convenience, for example, rather than having to shop for multiple products, multiple vendors, multiple tenders, multiple uh, auctions. Um, and so you want to leverage that convenience uh, value that the client may be saving. So that's what I call is a one-stop bundle where you can buy all of them together. And my example is a uh, Halliburton um, Bayride drilling system. Bayride is a unit of Halliburton, and uh, what they do is they sell valves and uh, uh, drill bits, but also they have services, and they, again, can be bought very independently, but that because the client uh, values convenience, they, that's how they do it. So, uh, Lori, can you just go over the slides? Uh, next slide. So this is just an expanded version of what I just talked to you. So Oracle's um, Hybrid Bundle is a business software on-demand consulting. And why does it work? And what are the key success drivers here? Uh, one is the commoditization. The good is commoditized. The database, there are lots of competition like Microsoft, SQL servers, uh, uh, so many uh, databases that says commodity. Uh, and, and so uh, next bullet, please, yeah. Uh, you can scale the service demand because when you start to combine, for example, if I offer you benefits of service in your industry-specific things, 
then I can scale it across all clients in the industry. So that is scalability. And it, there's also the case where customers choose service first and then good next. So in other words, they have a uh, IT problem, they want to solve that, and then the database is part of that. So that's why this works here. The next slide, please, Laurie. So when you think about peace of mind bundle, uh, let's take, I gave you the example of Otis Elevators, but G is another example. So go to the next bullet, Laurie. Um, so let's say G power plant, okay? And uh, it also offers fuel processing and maintenance service that goes with that. And why does it work? What are the key success drivers? The first and foremost is um, G cannot sell multiple power plants because it's very high capital intensive. So they have to think about uh, revenues through uh, steady uh, services. So they have to combine them in a way. So they have to offer a reliable solution uh, year on year basis because the power plant has to be maintained and so on. And this, there is a feasible business model that's kind of uh, uh, kind of a sweet spot for them that they can charge the clients for the power plant and the uh, and maintenance service together to give them peace of mind. Um, Lori, next slide, please. So they also do continuous innovation. So, for example, um, in some of the power plants, um, you know, they have to do uh, to really overcome obsolescence. They continuously innovate different elements of the power plant at different sections of the power plant every five years and so on so that keep the customers within themselves. The next is the multi-benefit bundle. I gave you the example of Cisco systems. Lori, you can go through this quickly. Um, we have already talked about router and services. And here, the key success drivers are, there's a higher revenue potential of service over the good because routers uh, are very competitive uh, as a hardware unit. So the service is the big uh, margin uh, play. Importance of brand is important to the client because a client has multiple offices and networking is very important across them. And so Cisco has a higher profit potential sometimes over the good. So this balancing that is very important. Next slide, Lori. So the next slide is the one stop, which I talked about Halliburton, drilling cap, valve and bed. They also offer fluid management services. And because the clients like, um, like the big oil majors look for this, um, one stop, Exxon Mobil and Chevron and so on. And also they, they need lots of people at different uh, geographies. So scope economies are very important and that's how they can derive some benefits out of that. So Lori, next slide, please. So in spite of this, a lot of companies that we actually surveyed over hundred, these experienced lots of problems and failures trying to sell hybrid bundles. So what are, uh, what are some of the issues that they face? How to structure the bundles? If at all, first of all, they don't identify the right bubble. For example, we found some companies not understanding the complementarity and independence, and then ending up offering one stop bundle when they should be offering peace of mind bundles. Uh, how to market, how to go to market with them, how to sell them, how to uh, in motivate, incentivize the sales force to do that. They were not very good at that. Uh, and we also find that most of the uh, hybrid bundles fail because of failure to differentiate. They don't understand uh, which one, the good or the service, or the commoditization is high, where, to, where the scope of differentiation. They also fa failure to scale. They don't uh, really understand where they can scale and how to scale them, right? Sometimes failure to assess markets and prices. For example, they'll overprice the good, underprice the service, or overprice the services underprice the good. And then lack of investment in the brand. So for example, they come up, a lot of companies come up with an offer, but then they want to invest in the brand. So you have to brand them so that customers understand this is a hybrid offering that they have to keep buying and repeat buying more and more. Lori, next slide. So in summary, we found a number of success drivers, right? One is the degree of commoditization. First is go and look at your market. Look at all the goods that you sell, all the services that you could possibly sell. Look at, see how commoditized they are, right? The more commoditized one of them, you want to combine that with the uh, non-commoditized service aspect or goods aspect. Second bullet, um, solution complexity of the market. So if your client comes and says, oh, I have a complex solution and so on, then you have to start breaking it down and say, what are the goods and services I can add to bring down the complexity? Just break it down bit by bit. Uh, and uh, 
Also, relative revenue and profit potential. Sometimes you'll find, oh, there's a great idea. I can combine this good and service, but then the profits may be higher in one and lower in the other. So you need to combine the two uh, effectively. The third success, fourth success level, scalability. Sometimes you may find a, high, a lot of profit in service, but then service may not be scalable, but the good may be scalable. So you have to figure out what is the optimal mix. And um, the next bullet, please. Importance of branding. A lot of companies, B2B companies, miss out on that, right? You have to come out with, like I gave you the example of Otis Gen 2 elevators. You have to really spend on the sub-brand Gen 2 so that they differentiate the, that. Otherwise, people will think, oh, there's another Otis elevator, another services that they have. Uh, next bullet, Lori. Order of customer charge. This is very important. You need to understand what customers buy. So, for example, telecom services. An AT&T or Verizon sell to their business customers. They have to understand whether they are buying the equipment first or the service first. And then the order actually determines which bundle will be most appropriate. Um, the next one, please. The role of digitization or digitizability in creating a manager. Uh, what do I mean by that? Many times you can scale service by getting digital components. We studied the medical uh, uh, that is, uh, they offer um, a service called Asset Plus that off offers remote monitoring, uh, diagnostic equipment like diabetes and so on. And that is a very inherently uh, very scalable. So uh, doing away with a lot of people and trying to uh, scale the service to understand how we can scale, use digitization wherever possible to scale. Degree to which purchase cycles for goods and services. This is a very important thing we found is that for some cases, you know, the goods may have a longer uh, uh, cycle because, you know, it's capital intensive, so it's bought once a year or once in 270 days and so on. But the services can be recurring every month or every quarter and so on. So we have to understand how to combine them to hedge that. Uh, next slide, Lori, please. Um, so here's a quick example of how which hybrid bundle will work when I mean, the commoditization is higher, low, and the revenue potential is low or high. Uh, for example, when commoditization is low, the customer problem is complex, a flexible bundle would be appropriate. Uh, commoditization high, product or service is uh, scalable, peace of mind will be more appropriate. When revenue potential is low and you know which components the customer choose first, then one stop bundle would be ideal. Um, revenue potential is high, but purchase cycles can are far apart, then multi-benefit bundle would be ideal. So in the interest of time, I'm not going into this, but I'm giving you four rules for you to think about uh, as you start thinking about designing and creating new hybrid model. First and foremost, look for points of differentiation in all the different goods and services markets that you have related markets, okay? Then the second uh, rule is uh, think about how do I scope the service? What do I mean by scope the service? Services of scope economies, that means if I centralize the service delivery and, uh, and then I can offer it multiple locations, that's scope economies. Whereas uh, goods or products have scale economies that produce more, sell more and more, then I, I lower the unit cost and then higher, higher margins. So look for opportunities where I can benefit from scope economies for service and scale economies for goods. Number three rule is assess the revenue and profit potential of all possible hybrids. Uh, don't jump into hybrid just because it seems like the customer wants it or everybody else is doing it, but it seems to be uh, very attractive uh, from the point of view of jumping the bandwagon. Uh, assess clearly where the profits lie and which one can be combined effectively. And finally, very important is that once you identify a hybrid bundle, start investing in the brand because most of the times, the hybrid bundle sticks to your client mainly because of the brand value and the brand assurance that it gives uh, whichever bundle you choose. So those are the four rules that I would like you to think about. And Lori, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so that's all I have for now um, because I want to give some time for taking questions and being able to answer them. I also um, uh, have uh, a list of references uh, three papers that I have, one including one Harvard Business Review article and two articles in academic journals, which has uh, a lot of managerially written, friendly portions that I can assure you will be relevant to you. And um, 
I also invite you to, uh, um, to communicate with me by email because many of you may have specific problems and I'd be very happy to talk to you individually uh, and work with you if you're interested uh, in that. I'm also doing more research, so if you're interested in, in participating in the research, um, you could talk to me and you know, share the data and tell, you, tell me what are your burning questions and I could try and address and answer them uh, as uh, effectively as possible. Uh, I also do uh, experiments with uh, companies where we try to come up with hybrid bundles and we see the effect of that. Um, so we actually do live uh, field studies with their sales force and we can do that too if you're interested in. So with that, I'm going to shut up now and take <laughs> questions. And, and so I'm going to just step in. This is Lynn and um, I'll let you invite you all to please write some questions. Thank you. That was very, very interesting. And um, for those of you that are on this webinar, thank you means it. If you guys are thinking about hybrid bundles and you're not sure what you might do or you'd like to just think about it openly and more differently than you have when you think about it inside your organization, Venki would be very interested in speaking with you. The big value we bring in doing research for our B2B clients is that we work on their real problems. So rather than trying to invent things that might be, it's clear we really would love to talk with those of you that are in the practitioner space and doing them. So the first question that came in, Benki, was how do we get a copy of the slides? So let me address that for you. Um, so after this webinar, the slides, and Venki, if you have those three preferred uh, papers that you want to provide yeah, either yeah. as objects or as links, um, we'll send that out to all of the participants that have registered for this webinar. So everybody will get that after the webinar. Uh, Lori has to put it all together, so it might take a day or so, but you'll get those all after this webinar. Right. I'll be more than happy to share all the slides plus the papers. Okay. And so uh, other questions. Now, it might be that you aren't sharing questions because you really have questions that are specific to your business and you're not comfortable sharing that in front of others. Totally understand that. Um, Venki does mean it too that you can please email him and he'd be happy to talk about your particular situation. I did find it fascinating because I had I've done this before in a past life that um, you talked about there being a difference between the um, basically the profitability in providing services versus the profitability in providing products and I think often we don't really think carefully about how those two things play off of each other. And I really appreciated the four box in terms of thinking about it. That very last slide you gave, like that was the key to this whole um, presentation. I, I can't wait to get that last slide, Benki, because now it's going to be posted up on my wall as I think about this. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, um, I'm sure you may have a lot of questions uh, just about the clarity of that too. I'll be happy to clarify. As I said before, it's, Webinars are monologues almost one way, uh, mm -hmm. and I hate that, but I'd like you to ask questions if some things were not clear. The papers actually will make it a little bit more clear than this. Okay, so I'm uh, going to talk a little slowly and make sure there's no other questions that people want to enter. And I'll also ask Lori, who's hosting. Lori, we don't have any difficulties. I'm not, I think I'm seeing everything. So, but if for some reason I've missed your question, you see email, email for Venki right there. It's very easy. It's Venki at VenkiShankar.com, or you can contact us at ISBM. I'll remind you as well that we have another uh, webinar coming up in a month um, about millennials, which should be fascinating as well for those of you that are hiring, managing, or trying to figure out how to get what you get what they need and what you need out of the relationship between them. I think you'll find that Nell's presentation will be excellent. So I hope you'll join us for that as well. Um, uh, so let me just sign off then for us. Thank you. Thank you again very much for sharing your research. Fascinating. Thank and you so much. And very uh, I appreciate okay. the opportunity. And uh, as I said before, my offer is genuine. So please do contact me. I hope they will. I think it's I think it's always great when we can get real data to you guys and you can take a look at that. So I hope they will. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lori. And thank you all the participants.